Citizen Kane is a 1941 American drama film produced by, co-written by, directed by, and starring Orson Welles. The picture was Welles' first feature film. It was nominated for Academy Awards in nine categories, an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay, and has been voted the greatest film of all time in five consecutive Sight and Sounds polls of critics. Citizen Kane is particularly praised for its cinematography, music, and narrative structure, which were innovative for its time. Citizen Kane had considerably more special effects work than in most Hollywood films of the era. There are two reasons for this, one being financial. Citizen Kane was made on a budget, and for the nature and scope of its subject, every effort was made to keep costs down. Wells' fondness for dramatic hyperbole is another reason for the abundance of many optical effects seen in the film. Citizen Kane made cinematic advancements on many fronts, and its most significant contribution to cinematography came from the use of a technique known as deep focus. Deep focus refers to having everything in the frame, even the background, in focus at the same time, as opposed to having only the people or object in the foreground in focus. The deep focus technique requires the cinematographer to combine lighting, composition, and type of camera lens to produce the desired effect. With deep focus, a filmmaker can showcase overlapping actions and mizen scene. The physical environment in which the film takes place becomes more critical. Effectively manipulating for deep focus actively engages the whole space of the frame without leaving the viewer confused. Deep focus is more effective in scenes that depict Kane's loss of control and his personal isolation because it gives the audience a clear view of the space Kane commands, as well as the space over which he has no power. In this shot, Director Orson Welles and cinematographer Greg Tolan want to indicate that the object being debated over and signed away is the boy, or young Kane, himself. But they want to do so visually, with subtlety. The bright white document, the contract that seals Kane's fate, is in the middle of the frame below the other bright white spot, also in the center of the frame, which contains the boy himself playing in the snow. By placing these two aesthetically similar segments of the image in proximity to one another, the filmmakers are urging viewers to notice them and in turn to consider their connection. By using shot composition, lighting, and deep focus cinematography, Wells and Tolan are creating a visual bridge as well as a thematic link between the boy and the papers that will forever change his life. During the scene when Charles Foster Kane is signing away his fortune, he stands and walks away from the camera toward a bank of windows and then returns. At the beginning of the scene, the windows look as though they are normal distance from the floor. However, as Kane walks toward them, we realize that the windows are actually more than six feet from the door. When he stands in front of these now enormous windows, he is absolutely diminished. Through the use of deep focus, Orson Welles is able to keep everything in the shot in focus and illustrate just how defeated and broken Kane is at that moment. The technique makes the meaning of Kane's admission of his own insignificance in that scene in the same way irony or simile or sound devices do in literature. In the living room scene, Kane and his wife Susan are in their enormous living room. Despite the vast distance between them, the deep focus photography keeps both figures in sharp focus, suggesting that their separation is not only a physical, but also an emotional one. Another clever deep focus trick was achieved with ultra-close foreground props, filmed against black velvet in a separate pass and flawlessly combined into the scene as an in-camera matte shot. One of Greg Tolan's innovations of exaggerated deep focus was accomplished with concealed soft split-screen mats. This allowed the foreground and background to be shot separately in sharp focus. It is estimated that as much as 50% of the film required special effects work of one sort or another. In some reels, the percentage of optically printed work is as high as 80%. Wells used a variety of miniatures and matte paintings to bring the world around Charles Kane to life. 
Linwood Dunn, who worked in optical effects for Citizen Kane, introduced Orson Welles to the optical printer, who used it like a paintbrush. In the library scene with the Thatcher statue in post-production, Orson Welles decided he would rather start at the top of the statue and pan down on the scene, as if the statue were already there on set. Using a two foot high statue, Linwood Dunn used the optical printer to make a motorized pan down which he then combined with a traveling mat. Here in the El Rancho shot, the camera moves up the side of a miniature nightclub exterior and over the rooftop, through the neon sign, and then over the roof and down into the club with actors. For the Florida procession, the road and sea were shot at Malibu in California, and the mat artist removed hilly terrain to the right and painted in a flatter environment as well as adding in the distant scenery. During the political rally, the scene was virtually all painted except for the stage. Note how the camera pushes in for added realism. In this scene, the setting in the distance is a rear projection plate by Harold Wellman. The midground is live action and the close foreground of the parrot has been introduced through a traveling matte process with the transparent bird's eye as a result of a flaw in the matting process. Here is arguably Citizen Kane's best matte shot, almost all paint, even the reflection on the polished floor with the two actors being the only live component. Orson Welles also used many miniature sets combined with live action composites to help bring a level of realism to his story. Seen here combining the painting with a miniature mountainside complete with dozens of stop motion trucks and machinery. Welles' use of deep focus wasn't the only tool applied in his groundbreaking masterpiece. Citizen Kane also features masterful staging and beautiful long shots, which at the time had never been done before. As seen in this long shot, which takes place during the opera house, the camera slowly pans up to two men reacting to her singing. This was accomplished by using a split screen pan from the stage to a miniature, off of the miniature, and finally up to the scene above. Some of the best cinematography is yet seen near the film's climax, where the image dissolves to a stained glass window in Xanadu, Kane's hideaway. We are trained to view such dissolves as nothing more than a way to go from one scene to another to show that time is passing. But note the progression of the dissolves imagery and how it bolsters and comments on the scene. How the scales of justice evolve from Susan's right eye and how an eye evolves from her left. Other images in the window include the bird, the book, and the chalice. Wells was just 25 when he would produce, direct, and star as Charles Foster Kane who in the film ages from a young man to a decrepit, involute man in his 70s. This transformation became the responsibility of Maurice Cederman, an unqualified young man working as a sweeper of hair in the RKO makeups department. To accomplish this, Cederman had to take a live casting of Wells's head. He also made a cap to cover his head, which had a certain level of elasticity which pulled on Orson's face. Citizen Kane has been called the most influential film of all time and would go on to establish many Hollywood tropes still used in cinema today.